Chapter 8 Dyer's Burgers and 100 Year Old Grease. By the early 2000s, Hunter's brief period of success in Memphis was drying up. He was alienating the wrong people. His repeated use of the same tactics he'd used against Ashante had come to the attention of several members of Willie Mitchell's family and they openly campaigned against him. He decided to put some space between himself and Royal Records for a while at his mother's urging. Close to 40, his mom was pushing him to get married, but even Belle could see that a 40-year-old man living with his mother wasn't much of a catch. She bought him a condo in Miami and then hired a consultant to write Hunter's profile for J-Date, the premier dating service for Jewish professionals. He didn't get farther than a few dates with the first three women he met through the app. As soon as he tried to exert control over them, they stopped answering his calls. They were more savvy and experienced than a lot of women he met in Memphis. One of them slapped a restraining order against him the first time he tried to wait for her after work. She hadn't told him where she worked, but these days, all it took was a couple of clicks on the computer. Then he found Anita. She was perfect. She was the only daughter of a very wealthy family who absolutely doted on her. When they invented the acronym for Jewish American Princess, they were talking about her. Her family was originally from Cuba, and her grandfather had started what was now a hugely successful clothing and tailoring company. What was even more perfect about Anita, besides her wealth, was the fact that this lovely, adored child had low self-esteem. He started by complimenting her. When she confessed that she was ashamed of her body due to her loose skin after having recent gastric bypass surgery, he initially pretended to love her anyway. She called her parents and told them he was the one. Not too much later, after the wedding invitations had been sent and the dress fittings completed, he began to bully her. It was subtle at first, under the guise of helpful advice. Sometimes it was under the guise of small, little inconsequential things about herself that she could change to please him. She felt misgivings at the wedding, but her whole family was there supporting her, so she figured it would be okay. She was taken aback when she met his mom at the ceremony. She looked decades younger than her age, but she had a cruel and bitter tongue. She had come back to the bride's room where Anita was getting ready and asked her attendants to leave. Everyone thought she had come to give some friendly advice or perhaps a gift. They were wrong. Once they had all left, Belle clicked her tongue. I guess today wasn't important enough for you to lose some more weight, huh? Hunter told me all about it. How do you expect to keep his interest if you don't even try? Anita's gown suddenly felt too tight. She couldn't breathe. She started gasping. It felt like a knife slicing through her heart. Belle had accomplished what she set out to do. She handed Anita a small box. It contained an overly ornate and tragically ugly brooch. She pushed it into the bodice of Anita's gown without warning, and Anita felt it prick her skin. She quickly pulled away as Belle said, Welcome to the family, and walked out. For the next half hour, her friends and family anxiously calmed her. Anita wanted to barricade herself in the room, and only the rabbi's wife was able to talk her into going down the aisle. She managed to convince Anita that she had somehow misunderstood Belle. She handed Anita a soft handkerchief to wipe off her face while she tried to attach the hideous piece of jewelry to her gown. Finally, she gave up and one of Anita's aunts borrowed an extra ribbon from the mother of the flower girl. They pinned the heavy brooch to the ribbon and fashioned it as a choker. The heavy weight of the brooch 
made her feel like she was suffocating. But she quickly smoothed her hair and finally allowed the ceremony to begin. It was a nice conservative Jewish ceremony and nothing seemed out of place. If the bride seemed a little flushed, well, that was only to be expected, right? Anita's life continued to go downhill after the wedding. Her father, Aaron, tried to bring Hunter into the business, but Hunter was sullen and unappreciative. He didn't want to start in the showroom. He wanted to be CEO. Because I'm going to get it one day anyway, he said to his hell and hearty father-in-law. He began trying to command the business, canceling fabric orders and trying to push long-term clients into pricier styles and unwanted items. One day, he attempted to fire one of Aaron's long-term employees after berating him during the staff meeting. Aaron was appalled as Levi had been with the company over 30 years. He tried to cajole Levi into staying, but after finding out he wasn't fired, the humiliated Levi quit. That was enough for Aaron. He was ready to annul Anita's marriage. Obviously, they had made a terrible mistake. His daughter was miserable and now borderline anorexic, and his new son-in-law was a total meshugane if he was being charitable. Aaron didn't feel charitable. He was ready to strangle Hunter when Hunter came to inform him that he and Anita were returning to Memphis. Aaron beseeched Anita not to go, but she had such a hopeful look in her eyes when she told her dad she was pregnant. It's a new start, Daddy. Don't worry. He'll do better. He just didn't do well because he felt like you put too much pressure on him. Like he could never do anything right. It'll be better in Memphis. He's going to back to working in music. He likes that. Anita said, almost desperate. Aaron didn't like the way Anita seemed almost frantically hopeful. But what could he do? He could only be there for her. To Anita's surprise, Hunter didn't have an apartment ready for them. When they arrived in Memphis, after a long, hot drive, they pulled up to his mother's house. He turned to her and told her it was only temporary, but it was readily apparent by his mother's behavior that she expected it to be anything but. As she stepped inside the large two-story home, Anita almost fainted when she saw the filth and disorder. It was almost indescribable. There were layers of oriental rugs partially covering each other. On top of the rugs was another layer of dust, lint, and long dry dog excrement. A large German shepherd lay sleeping on a pile of filthy stained pillows in the middle of the floor. Yellowed and curly newspapers peeped out from beneath the pillows. The dog appeared ill, with sad eyes, laying in his own waist. The smell of the living room was staggering. There were piles of unopened mail, magazines, and newspapers stacked on every surface. Broken antique furniture crowded into the room, along with the sagging and stained couch piled with old quilts. There were dried bits of food clinging, it seemed, to almost everything. Dirty plates covered in tables and appeared piled high in the kitchen sink, which she could see just at the corner of her vision. Anita's stomach began to roll. She started to run to the bathroom, but when she saw the mounds of old, wet towels blocking the door, she changed course and ran back outside to the driveway, where she started dry heaving. As she came back in, prepared to demand that they stay in a motel, she heard Belle berating Hunter for her poor manners. Why, she couldn't even be bothered to greet me. Her own mother-in-law? What kind of person is she? She hung back from the doorway to hear if Hunter was going to defend her. He didn't. 
Instead, he offered a weak excuse. Well, she is pregnant. It was probably just an attack of morning sickness. Besides, mother, the way she eats, I'm not surprised she's ill. Well, at least she's pregnant, Belle answered. It's not like she was doing anything else. In fact, Anita had been one of the head designers at her father's company. She was still collaborating with her dad and was currently working on the upcoming season's fashion line. She didn't think she could stand in the doorway all night, so Anita finally made her way back into the house, only to hear Belle mutter, and her majesty arrives. Hunter led her upstairs to his suite of rooms, which were crammed full of his clothes, music memorabilia, and almost everything he had ever owned since he was a very young child. There was barely room to stand. There was a bed with an enormous four-poster wooden frame and a visibly sagging mattress. There was a thick layer of dust on everything, and a cloud of dust arose when Hunter settled himself on the bed. Anita felt something scrunching underneath her feet, only to find another oriental rug, this one seemingly covered with debris from every meal ever eaten in the room. She stepped out into the hall and saw a bathroom. She headed into the bathroom to wash her face with some cold water. There were no clean towels, and she refused to use one of the dirty crumbled towels from off the floor. She almost started dry heaving again when she looked over and saw the toilet bowl was black. The lid and the seat were up, and she could see crusted feces on the bottom of the seat. She wanted to die or disappear into another realm of existence. She went back into the bedroom, where Hunter was casually lounging on the bed, flipping channels with the remote. He seemed completely unperturbed by anything. While Anita felt frightened, her rolling stomach compelled her to speak up, so she found her voice. We can't stay here, she said almost in a whisper. Please, please, Hunter, let's go to a hotel. She saw his face harden, and she knew what that meant, so she decided to try and cajole him. Please, sweetheart, let's stay at a hotel so we can have some alone time. She said, feeling scared and sick. She tried to pretend she felt amorous, but she was so horrified and disgusted by the state of the house that she was anything but. Hunter was impervious to her pleas and completely undisturbed by the state of the house. He never lifted a finger to help her at their home back in Boca Raton, but she had never seen filth like this. She had only briefly visited his apartment in Miami a couple of times before he moved in with her. She tried one more time to convince Hunter that they should stay somewhere else and look for their own apartment in the morning, but he refused. Then he began to cut her apart with his words. She felt a light go out inside her as his words washed over her as he told her how repellent she was how ugly, how unattractive, and worthless. A small, self-protective part of her wanted to argue back that it wasn't true, but a larger part just wanted him to stop. She collapsed into a puddle of tears on that crusted and filthy carpet, coated with animal hair, old peanuts, and crumbs from every possible source. The carpet stuck to the backs of her thighs as she curled herself into a ball, crying, and tried to tune him out. She cried silently for hours, long after Hunter had found a bottle of vodka in his bag and drank himself into a stupor. As he snored and passed wind, she rocked herself and contemplated suicide. She just didn't see another way out. In the end, she knew she couldn't do it because the life inside her. It was barely even a teaspoon at this stage, but she felt protective of it. She knew that she would have to find a way out, 
If only so she could protect the son she knew was counting on her. The need to protect her unborn child galvanized Anita in a way that nothing ever had before. She initially tried to keep the peace with Hunter, but he came home blitzed every night and seemed to enjoy terrorizing her. She came to realize that she just needed to buy some time before she made her escape. So as much as it disgusted and galled her, she spent part of her days cleaning the revolting mess that consists of Hunter's small suite. She thought about fleeing back to Florida to her family right away, but she realized that as long as she was pregnant, she was in danger. She didn't put it past either Hunter or his mother to harm her if they thought she was taking the unborn child away. While this seemed contradictory, she knew that Hunter would rather she miscarry than for her to raise the baby alone. As for Belle, she seemed to hate and resent everything about Anita, including her pregnancy. Once she cleaned the upstairs suite to something resembling a safe living environment, she either spent her time wandering the neighborhood or she stayed hidden upstairs. On the few occasions she ventured downstairs, Belle had immediately attempted to strike her with her viper's tongue. On one occasion, the elderly woman had even made an attempt to physically attack her. On her last visit downstairs, Belle had tried to seek the German shepherd on her, but while the dog stood there and barked ferociously, it didn't attack her. Anita no longer felt sad or depressed, she felt angry. She didn't have a car, and Hunter stayed out all hours of the night and usually came back intoxicated. He didn't seem to know or care where her life was like trapped in the upstairs of the moldering house in Cordova. Sometimes, she wondered if he really even remembered he was married, but she didn't really care to remind him. She was too busy working on her plan to get out of there. If the weather was nice, she would take the opportunity to escape the house into fresh, clean air. If she walked for about a mile, she could just reach some of the small shopping centers on Germantown Parkway. She would bring a backpack and buy small amounts of groceries to squirrel away in her rooms. She also contacted her mother to let her know that she would be making her way home soon. Her mother had wanted to come to Memphis and get her right away, but she'd managed to convince her to wait. Sometimes, she wondered if she was being ridiculous not to leave right away. Hunter honestly wasn't interested in being married anymore. He barely even spoke to her most days and never asked what her life was like. Other times, after he returned from a light night in Neil's, drunk, smelling like cigarette smoke and other women's perfume and slurring his words, he'd say things like, you're never getting away from me. We're going to have a baby and be a family. And other even darker things. And she knew that it was best that she bide her time. Other nights, she'd hear him come in and the terrible fights he'd have with Belle downstairs with her screaming all kinds of terrible abuse. Belle had an almost evangelical zeal against alcohol of any kind, and she abhorred smoking. She acted like a jealous wife, screaming things at Hunter that Anita didn't dare. She also started to sound like a fire and brimstone Christian preacher, which seemed absurd to Anita, but she just stayed upstairs. Who are these whores you've been out with? How dare you come back to my house smelling like alcohol and these whores? You are going to burn in hell for what you are doing. You think I don't know? You think God doesn't know what you are doing? Do you think you can hide it from him? He knows what you are. He knows that you are going to burn. Bill would scream hysterically. Often the dog would join in barking furiously, and then Belle would begin throwing and breaking things. 
Anita had cleared out a small section of space upstairs in Hunter's section of the house. It had been crammed with boxes that she had slowly pushed down the hall to an overfilled storage space. As her pregnancy advanced, she'd had to be careful lifting and pulling items, but Hunter was never around to help. It was strange how absent he had become. In some part of her mind, she also knew it was strange that she didn't care but she remained focused on planning her permanent escape. She mindlessly mouthed empty sentiments to Hunter when he was around, and he either accepted them at face value or just didn't care enough to challenge her. Now that she was more visibly pregnant, he seemed to enjoy touching her abdomen at night. When he was home, he would force her to sleep in the crook of his arm, so he could rest his hand on her rounded belly. There was no affection in his touch, but it was another way for him to demonstrate his ownership. Thankfully, he didn't seem to want sex from her anymore because she didn't know how to get out of it and she didn't think she could lay there and endure it either. She worried that something like that would have long-term damage to her psyche. As it was, she already knew that her prison-like existence wasn't healthy. He had taken her out of the house one Saturday afternoon after he returned from the Orthodox synagogue he was now attending. Since the women were separated from the men, she didn't think that anyone ever noticed she wasn't there. She had never even met the congregation. She wondered what excuse he made for her absences. But on that Saturday afternoon, he had taken her to a small get-together of one of his childhood friend's homes. She had a large, beautiful home on Walnut Grove, and she had invited several couples for an afternoon repast. Don't embarrass me, Anita, Hunter said as he drove her to the house. I've known these people all my life so they aren't likely to believe any of your lies anyway. Anita had no idea as to what lies he was referring. He and Anita barely exchanged a dozen words on a daily basis. It was a great overcast spring day with on and off showers most of the morning. As they entered the warm, brightly lit, welcoming home, it was like a switch turned on. Hunter became the smiling, laughing, charming man she thought she'd known before she married him. Now all she could think was that he was smooth like a snake. He gave elaborate introductions as he introduced her to everyone in the room and told everyone that her terrible, terrible morning sickness was the reason for her prior absences. He kept an arm around her shoulders as he would steer her from couple to couple. Finally, he parked her at a table between Michelle Gates and Jody Lewis while he went off to the buffet-style setup to make her a plate. Michelle and Jody shared a glance but were not overly friendly. Jody, in particular, had a hostile, off-putting air. It wasn't until the hostess of the event sat at the table that anyone made any real conversations with her. Hunter stayed close by, almost sitting on the back of her chair while she interacted with his friends. At this point, she almost didn't know how to communicate with people anymore. She stayed quiet but polite, if withdrawn. Rachel Mathis touched the back of her hand at one point and reassured her that she wouldn't stay shy once she knew the rest of the group. The charade continued for close to three hours while Hunter steadily consumed multiple scotches before taking her home. She felt nervous about being in a car with him driving, obviously intoxicated, but she didn't know what else to do. He chastised her on the ride home for being standoffish but she just ignored him. She still had her cell phone and she would use it only when she was out of the house. 
She didn't want to remind Belle or Hunter that she was there. She honestly thought that sometimes they forgot that she was living there. Hunter never even asked how she was surviving and coping in all the isolation. She'd had to muster her courage to push for prenatal visits. He couldn't be bothered to take her, so she was forced to go to her appointments with Belle as her chaperone. It was this, more than anything, that made her really despise the barons. As she entered her last month and the appointments became more frequent, she just gritted her teeth and stayed silent. She would just look at the window of Belle's red Cadillac coupe while Belle would carry on. Belle would always insist on bringing the damn dog with them too. So the car was often overwhelmed with the smell of the slobbery, poorly trained animal as it paced around the back seat. Belle would make comments about how Anita had taken the dog's spot in the front passenger seat. You know, Anita, I just don't know what all this carrying on is about. In my day, pregnant women didn't do so much carrying on. I don't know why you think you are such royalty that you can't even climb into the back seat. But then again, you've certainly let yourself go so much. So I don't wonder that you are too fat and clumsy to climb in the back. I never carried on quite like this when I was having Hunter. Belle would go on and on for the entire 20 minutes it took to get to the doctor's office. Anita didn't know if Belle thought she didn't know about the adoption or if Belle had just rewritten her own history, but she got endless lectures about how Belle hadn't required all this special treatment like routine prenatal care when she was carrying her hunter. And what turned out to be her second to last appointment before she gave birth? One of the office nurses forbade Belle from accompanying Anita back into the exam room. Belle began to complain loudly, but Anita quickly followed the nurse back to the weigh-in area. The nurse, Sharice Brandon, looked at her with kind eyes and said, I've watched you on your last three appointments. I know that something is going on. Now you don't have to tell me anything, but we are here for you. Just tell us what we need to do to keep you safe and get you out of this situation. Anita felt so incredibly grateful that she wasn't entirely invisible to the world. When she went back to the exam room, she started to talk. She memorized the emergency number that Sharice gave her and then took her into her confidence, explaining that while she was in a bad situation, it hadn't turned violent yet and she had an escape plan. The nurse quickly contacted the obstetrician and brought her into the room. The doctor wanted to contact the police or social services, but they respected Anita's decision not to. Both the doctor and the nurse made sure that the appointment continued to carry on smoothly with no delays or anything else that might make Belle suspicious. Sharice accompanied Anita back to the waiting room and briefly reminded her in front of Belle that she had another appointment in a week. At the final appointment, Anita reviewed her plan with the doctor and Sharice. They promised to contact the hospital and make the security arrangements for her. During the first week of May, Anita was standing outside the house, debating on taking a short walk when her water broke. She used her cell phone to call 911 and summon an ambulance. Then she called the obstetrician's office and her parents. Belle insisted on climbing into the ambulance with her, and she had a moment of panic, but she kept her calm, unemotional facade during the trip. Once she arrived at the hospital, she left Belle at the admissions waiting room to complete insurance paperwork while she was wheeled back to a birthing suite. Charisse and a social worker were waiting for her. She outlined her plan to them once again. As Charisse left the suite, she grabbed Anita in a big hug. 
You will get through this, Anita. I know you will. Then you will get out of here and start a new life. Anita's plan allowed Hunter to be at her side while their son, David, was born, but Belle was forced to wait outside. Anita didn't want her near her baby for even a moment. The next step of the plan came when Hunter, already bored of it all, decided to step outside the birthing suite and away from Anita and their newborn son for a cigarette. The hospital immediately initiated a call fuchsia, which was a domestic violence plan initiated by the hospital a few years prior. Hunter and his mother were barred from entering the postpartum and delivery floor. The baby stayed in the suite with Anita at all times. Her parents were already on their way from Florida. After they arrived and Anita was medically cleared for discharge, she and the infant were wheeled down to a secure private exit on the side of the hospital. Two security officers watched as she was loaded into the rental car for the ride back to Florida. She took nothing with her except for the small bag that had come with her to the hospital. Once in the car, she fled from Tennessee, never to return. She filed emergency divorce papers from Florida. She didn't ask for anything except the restraining order. Five years later, Hunter will petition for supervised visits with his son, David, but otherwise, to Hunter and to Memphis, it was like she never existed. For Anita, it wasn't simple. The months of neglect and abuse had damaged her badly, and she had a hard time trusting anyone, and especially her own intuition for a long time to come. Finally, after a lot of therapy and 18 months in the bosom of her loving family, she was able to rebuild her life. She never returned to Memphis, and she tried not to let her son go either. It wasn't until he was in his teens that he met his grandmother in person and learned what his father's life was like. After spending two weeks at his grandmother's house when he was 13, he begged his mother to never make him go again. She did her best to comfort him and then asked her lawyer to file a motion with the family court to that effect. This episode was narrated by Zipporah Gray of RMP Studios in Memphis, Tennessee.